Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's uh, Chain Reaction Research webinar. We appreciate you joining us for our discussion on deforestation risks in the Sahado. We know that the COVID-19 outbreak and its economic fallout are front and center on all of our minds, and we hope that you are safe and in good health. We also hope today's discussion can be insightful and worthwhile for you. I'm Matt Piotrowski with Climate Advisors, which is part of the CRR Consortium, along with Aid Environment and Profundo. You can find our reports and theory of change on our website at chainreactionresearch.com. Our focus today will be on the global soy market and its impact on forests in the Brazilian Sahado. We will be discussing highlights of a report published late last year, which covered the main destinations for soy source from the Sahado. The global market for soybeans has exploded in recent years, with higher production growth in Brazil adding to forest and biodiversity loss in the country. Before we get going, a few housekeeping issues. Everyone in the audience is on mute, but if you have any questions, you can type your questions into the Q&A and we will answer them after our presentation. Also, um, since we're all doing this from our home offices, we appreciate your patience with any issues that we have with um, uh, connect, internet, internet connectivity. Hopefully we won't have too many problems, but um, just in case. And now I'm gonna hand it over to Barbara Cooper of Profundo and Tim, Tim Steinweg of Aid Environment for the main presentation. Hello, I hope that you can hear me clearly. Um, I'm afraid that Tim is not with us yet. So I will start on the presentation. Uh, also for the first couple of slides, uh, bear with me if I'm... Uh, uh, be prepared for that because that was actually the part. Next slide, Matt. So the Cerrado is a savanna biome in uh, the northwest and center of Brazil. It covers around 20% of the, the surface of Brazil. So the, the Cerrado is a savanna biome in Brazil, which has very rich and biodiverse native vegetation. It plays a key role, among others, as a carbon sink. It has a cru crucial role in the water systems in Brazil. It provides livelihoods to traditional communities and is most of all the most biodiverse savanna in the world. Unfortunately, this uh, biome has seen alarming rates of native vegetation clearing in the past decades. Uh, if we look at it now, only about 55% of the native vegetation remains. And within the, the savanna vegetation that forms the Cerrado, the deforestation hotspot that we're seeing at the moment is in a region referred to as Matupiba, which is uh, made up of the initials of four states, Maranhão, Tocantins, Piauí, and Bahia which uh, is the current deforestation hotspot and a kind of frontier of agricultural development. Next slide, please. So what we're seeing here are the deforestation rates in the Cerrado during the last uh, 19, 20 years. It is, however, really important to interpret these figures correctly. This may give the impression that actually the situation has improved considerably during the last years, which is true overall. Deforestation uh, surface that is being deforested has decreased quite considerably. However, it is important to look at the hotspots that we're observing, where rates are quite a bit higher than this. We will see that uh, this is actually the outline of the Cerrado. It is roughly the surface area of Mexico which uh, covers the, the center and north parts of Brazil. What you see here is in green, soy planted area that is uh, developed in the Cerrado. And uh, Matt, if you show the next slide, please. You see now the deforestation that occurred only in the years 2018 and 2019, which shows that there are certain parts that have considerably higher deforestation rates than others. And that is especially the case in the region that is referred to as Matupiba. 
within the northern part. So if what I said earlier, if we look at hotspots in soy areas, then the picture is different, especially if you look at uh, the 2019 bar, where deforestation actually increased quite considerably. That's referring to municipalities, including Formosa do Rio Preto, for example, where deforestation rates are considerably higher than in other um, municipalities in the Cerrado. The next, next picture shows Formosa do, uh, uh, a shot of um, Formosa do Rio Preto, where deforestation in 2018 and 2019 is visualized in the yellow marked area of the municipality. This is from a, a recent report that Chain Reaction Research has published on a company called JJF Holdings, where you also see the silos of various um, soy traders and processors, including Bangli Cargo and, um, and Amaji. The areas marked in red have been deforested in 2018-19. Similar picture can be shown of the municipality of Corentina, which is the next slide, where again the red marks deforest, newly deforested areas and uh, silos of traders are marked with little um, symbols as well. This is in an area where SLC Agricola and Brazil Agro have um, production in the Cerrado. So what we can uh, take away from this is that um, deforestation is actually a multi-dimensional issue. It's context driven, so it depends very much on where you look. It's not a necessarily that um, the picture looks the same in, in municipalities that are close to each other. There are various drivers of deforestation. There is certainly the development of um, prominent for, uh, for commodity production, but there's also issues around land grabbing, speculation, farmland investments that are often actually overlooked as drivers. Um, the dynamics in the Cerrado are quite different in that sense from the Amazon, where, for example, the issue of legality is uh, very different. In the Cerrado, much of the deforestation is actually legal. Um, which is quite different than in the Amazon, where much larger areas have to be uh, reserved. Uh, the deforestation patterns are different, and for a part also the commodities that are being produced are different, as um, most of you will know that the key deforestation driver in the Amazon when it comes to agriculture production is currently cattle, and soy plays a much smaller role in that. Uh, the issue of land tenure security, speculation and investment in farmlands certainly plays a very important role as well. There are economic incentives to actually um, develop land for commodity production as well as land asset appreciation. So this is something that has also played into the deforestation patterns that we are seeing. The analysis of hotspots shows that some companies are much more exposed than others. Uh, Chain Reaction Research has published various reports on the issue looking at actual um, uh, deforestation on the land of soy producing companies where um, these hot spots can be very clearly observed. Um, there are various developments in, uh, especially also in the Cerrado, for example, the Soft Commodity Forum where traders have come together and have started to monitor the the situation in certain priority municipalities and we have to observe how this is going to actually help in changing what is happening in the in the Cerrado and especially in Matupiba as the hotspot as we see it at the moment. So from this we are going to move over to looking more at the soy supply chain um, from Brazil and looking as much as it's possible at the role of the Cerrado and specifically um, the Matupiba region as the hotspot of deforestation uh, that is hampered to a certain degree by the fact that um, the data availability and especially the granularity of data that can be accessed is 
often quite limited. And especially once certain processing stages have been entered, it is incredibly difficult to trace where soy is coming from and where it is going to. So this is going to give a bit more of a generic picture of the soy market and the key players on it. have driven the expansion of soy globally. The US used to be the largest producer for many years, but has been overtaken by South America and then specifically by Brazil in recent years. The South American countries together are now accounting for roughly 57% of global production, but Brazil yeah, this is actually uh, showing the, the highest um, increase and is now accounting for about one third of world soybean uh, production and supply. The, the drivers for this boom are certainly the rapidly growing global meat industry and other livestock products industries, as well as a growing market for vegetable oils. That is both for edible oils as well as uh, uses in uh, the chemical industry and in biodiesel. So that has made soybeans actually the primary protein crop globally now. The majority of um, soybean production is crushed. There's only a small share that is consumed as beans that is um, used for um, especially the production of food products in some countries and small shares of beans are also used in animal feed. The vast majority of soy is crushed into soy meal and soybean oil. Uh, that's around 78.5% soybean meal on average and 18.5% soybean oil. The graphic on this slide shows, a, well, it's trying to visualize the supply chain of soy um, from Brazil. Um, of the total production, around 23% is used domestically. That's the top part of the graphic. And um, of the Matupi production, that's roughly 25%. Uh, for soy exports, that's about 77% of the total production. And for Matupiba soy, that's a share of about 75%. Um, in Brazil, soy is on the one hand used as a very important ingredient in compound feeds for the large livestock industry in the country. On the other hand, it's, as I mentioned before, used as an edible oil, the, the soybean oil that um, comes from crushing as well as that it's used in the production of biodiesel. Uh, when we look at soy exports, um, that is a mix of unprocessed or crushed soy. Um, as well as soy embedded in livestock products. That's the two top uh, circles here. So that means that the soy has been used in Brazil as an animal feed and these livestock products are then exported. And we'll get back to that later in a bit more detail. And at the same time, as I said, large volumes of soybeans as well as especially soybean meal are exported to global destinations. And again, we'll look at that in a bit more detail later. Um, so um, yeah, uh, in summary for the, the overall supply, the, the four Matupiba states that we looked at earlier accounted for about 10% of Brazilian production. They do have the highest risk of deforestation though uh, in, in current times. Um, what is uh, very important to note is that uh, the Brazilian uh, market is also consuming large volumes of soy. It has the third largest feed industry in the world and um, also exports considerable shares of livestock products. So there's a whole range of companies and sectors involved in the soy supply chain. Uh, if we look at the midstream, so that is um, traders, crushers, and well, companies sourcing. Uh, soy that often involves the same companies. The leading crushers with presence in Matupiba include the ABCD companies of soy trading in a slightly reversed order. ADM Bangi Cargo, ALZ Graus is a joint venture between the Brazilian Amaji and Louis Dreyfus company and the Japanese company Zenno. Uh, these four companies combined control more than 42% of the soy trade from Matupiba. Um, 
for some of them, their share in Matu Piba is actually bigger than their share in uh, the crushing um, on the national level in Brazil. All these companies are at the same time also important producers of edible oils and operate as well in the biodiesel market with market shares between three and nine percent. And um, as is mentioned in the table here, also um, Amaji entered the sector in 2019. The Brazilian biodiesel market is second only to the US, so it's a, a very important um, market also for uh, soybean oil. Uh, in the most recent available years, soybean oil accounted on average for around 70%, 77% of biodiesel feedstock in Brazil. So if we're looking at the livestock industry in Brazil, um, it is one of the largest globally. The country is characterized by a very high per capita meat consumption. It is obviously known as an important um, producer of beef. Um, However, beef is mostly grass-fed in Brazil, so um, it's not playing a big role in um, animal feed consumption. Um, it is, though, the second uh, producer and the largest exporter of uh, poultry meat and uh, the fourth most important producer and exporter of pork. And um, the feed industry is the third largest in the world, which um, is uh, largely driven by these two sectors, which is broilers and layers, as well as pigs. Um, the share of soy meal is typically highest in feed for broilers and layers. If you look at average feed composition in compound feeds, this is followed by pig feed and a smaller share in dairy cattle feed. Uh, that means if, if we look at these distributions that um, Broilers and layers, which are here shown as accounting for roughly 55% of livestock feed in Brazil, probably have a larger share in, um, in soy consumption, purely due to the relatively high share of soy meal in poultry feed. Um, characterizes the Brazilian feed industry is that the market is highly integrated. The three companies that we see here as the key producers of animal feed, BRF, JBS, and Aurora Alimentos. If we move on to the next slide already, you will see that the same companies show up as leading meat producers, meat and livestock, I have to say, and um, egg and dairy producers. Uh, so again, we see here JBS, BRF, and Aurora as as leading companies in uh, the production of broiler meat, uh, pork and dairy. Uh, for layers, uh, so for egg production, there's other companies that uh, take the first spots. Uh, so the top three animal feed producers are actually also the leading meat packers. They accounted for a combined share of roughly 21% of domestic feed production. Um, that is, um, well, the, the industry, the integration in the industry, what that means is that the leading companies provide farmers with all inputs that are required for the production, which includes animal feed, um, for which in return the farmers deliver livestock for slaughter exclusively to these companies. If we move away then from the domestic market, I'm not going to go into all detail. There's a lot more to say about this, but I'll just give, give a, a brief overview of um, the export markets for soy as well as embedded soy. So that refers then to soy that has been used to produce products that are then exported. Um, for direct export destinations of soy that was produced in Matupiba. I'm relying here on data from Trace, for which the most um, up-to-date data is uh, for the year 2017. It shows that um, soy produced in Matupiba states um, was predominantly exported to China. Um, the second most important market was the domestic Brazilian market and then followed by the EU countries, the EU member states, and much smaller shares for countries like Thailand, Japan, Indonesia, and some other destinations with small shares in the export of soy. Uh, that can be exports of soybeans as well as soy meal and soybean oil. That depends 
on the preferences in countries. China imports almost exclusively soybeans for crushing in their own industry, while the EU mostly imports soybean meal from Brazil. So I'm just very briefly going to cover the, the markets in these countries. Um, China has a very large livestock industry itself, especially for pork and poultry production. Pork production has seen a decrease in recent years um, due to the impact of the African swine fever that has this decreased the pig inventory in the country quite significantly in recent years. It's a bit difficult to quantify, but um, it certainly had an impact on uh, soy trade, which now is not yet reflected in these figures. Um, it also, on the other hand, the trade with between Brazil and China would have been impacted by the ongoing uh, trade war between uh, the US and China, which means that China has more um, uh, sourced from Brazil and uh, much, much less from the US. Again, this is not yet reflected here, so that will have impacted the trade patterns. Um, the production in China, uh, it's the largest producer still of pork meat. It's a very big uh, poultry meat producer and also uh, produces quite a lot of eggs. This is for the domestic market almost exclusively. Um, if we look at uh, EU countries, the EU, um, it's a little bit more complicated to break it down by country. Uh, I've put in a pie chart here that shows which countries are consuming most soy meal in the EU. That's uh, Spain, Germany, Italy and France as the, the countries that have the largest livestock industry. Um, but um, especially Germany and the Netherlands are also very important entry points for soy meal from Brazil as well as Spain. The, the special situation for the Netherlands and Germany is that these are also very important transshipment countries. So it's difficult to, to get a clear picture of where soy from Brazil is eventually consumed. It could be on the domestic market. It could also be exported to other mostly European countries which receive um, soy from Brazil, but also from the US, Argentina and other producing countries via Germany, the Netherlands and other countries that we export. That makes it very difficult to actually trace soy within the European Union. The EU has a large livestock industry. It uh, produces uh, especially a lot of pork as well as poultry. It's a very big uh, producer of eggs and a large producer of dairy products also. So this um, graphic is summarizing the flows of embedded soy. Uh, that means it's um, focusing on exports of Brazilian poultry and pork meat for the year 2018. Um, especially poultry is a very large export industry for Brazil. Key destinations, again, you can see here China as the largest recipient also for pork. Pork exports are much smaller, but still China is the key recipient um, for poultry. Also a couple of Middle Eastern countries like Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates and some other countries are important destinations. The EU is mostly receiving poultry due to its own large pork industry, it's not importing pork from uh, Brazil. Um, so in summary, um, when we look at the trade of soy from Brazil, which again, I have to stress that uh, it's not possible to focus these kind of breakdowns on certain origins that is getting very difficult at some point because you lose track of the soy on the way. That is due to a lack of transparency in many of these supply chains. Um, a key observation is that imports are driven by massive deficiencies in domestic protein production in destination countries. In the EU, the lack of self-sufficiency in protein production, especially for the livestock industry, has been widely discussed in recent years, including discussion of policy instruments for the development of plant proteins and, and an increase of domestic uh, production and various national strategies to improve domestic protein supplies. Mm. The trade between Brazil and China has undergone a couple of changes, as I mentioned, in recent years. 
that may not be fully reflected in these figures yet. Um, that is mostly the US-China trade war as well as the impact of the African swine flu in China. Um, so yeah, that will have an impact that we will see now in new statistics. Um, I'm not going to go now into all the different um, companies that are uh, important in these sectors. You can find that in the report that is on the Chain Reaction Web, Chain Reaction Research website. Um, it's maybe interesting to just say that also in China, the feed and meat producers are highly integrated, while that these are quite separated industries in Europe. So just briefly looking at business and investment risks that we can see in the, in the soy supply chain. Um, yeah, financial institutions, banks, as well as institutional investors provide financing throughout the entire soy supply chain. Uh, due to this broad exposure, financiers and investors face business risks and investment risks from soy-driven deforestation throughout these different stages of the supply chain that provides ample opportunities to engage. Um, if we look at um, downstream consumer goods companies, that includes food retailers, restaurant chains, food companies, and other uh, sectors, these are mostly exposed to reputation risk. Many of the consumer facing companies are members of the Consumer Goods Forum and they face conflicts with zero deforestation commitments from 2020 if they uh, do not manage to uh, eliminate deforestation from their supply chain. Um, we look at midstream soy traders, they could face market access risks from lagging the zero deforestation policies as well as financing risks. We have um, in previous uh, chain reaction research reports uh, looked at several of the leading soy traders in Brazil, where we found that uh, stranded asset risk is actually limited in this sector, but other risks are very prominent. Um, soy producing companies at the very upstream end of the supply chain they face in short market access risks, but also financing risk, and in this case, also stranded asset risk from deforestation. In Brazil, farmers are often financed by local Brazilian banks or local affiliates of international banks, as well as barter agreements with the soy traders. But the large farmers are also financed by international banks and shareholders. Some of them are actually listed on stock exchanges. And several of these finances, notably the ones that are based in Europe, could face reputation risk from deforestation and, on the other hand, may uh, start engaging with the companies. With this, I'm uh, coming to the end of the presentation, so um, we could move to questions of clarification or other questions that are being raised. Great, Barbara. Uh, thanks a lot for that. Um, that was a great presentation, and we have a number of questions that uh, we can get to for you and Tim. Um, but before that, uh, I've also received a number of questions about sharing this, uh, the presentation. We will definitely do that on our website, and we'll also have a recording of this, of this, um, of this presentation too. So, and if anybody's also inter interested in reading the report that this presentation is based on, you can get in touch with me, Barbara, or Tim, and we can provide you the, um, the, the link to that. Uh, uh, now to the Q&A um, for Barbara and Tim. How much of the problem of legal deforestation is driven by speculation and sectors outside of soy? Um, this is uh, Tim speaking. Um, sincere apologies for uh, my absence at the beginning of this call. Um, just to address the issue of the, uh, of the legal deforestation and other sectors, I think it is important to recognize that soy is not the key driver of deforestation either in Brazil or the Cerrado. Um, it's a uh, multi annual issue with, with a variety of different economic drivers. Uh, not just in terms of different commodities, but I think also the both the speculation and investments um, in farmland as an underlying asset is a is a factor that's often overlooked. 
but that in particular regions in Brazil have played quite an important role in um, driving agricultural expansion. Um, um, and the legality obviously plays a role in that as well, whereby we have seen that happen on a larger scale in areas like the Serrano, where uh, uh, clearing of native vegetation is mostly uh, falls within um, domestic regulations, as opposed to the Amazon, where we do see more um, illegal land claims um, um, and land clearing. Um, so what we we do see that there is a, a dynamic that does involve additional sectors as well. Okay, great. Uh, thanks. Uh, next question is, um, how much is uh, is policy a driver of deforestation? Is biofuel policy also a factor in deforestation? in Brazil? That's actually <laughs> a difficult question. Well, yeah, uh, when it comes to soy, often um, the often fingers are pointed at each other, saying that the, uh, the increase in production is either driven by the oil or driven by the meal that is uh, produced from soybeans. Uh, I think you can't have the two separated um, from calculations that we've done in the past. It's quite clear that one product can't economically survive without the other. But um, if we purely look at the volumes, then there may be a slight uh, um, uh, animal feed, soy meal and animal feed may be somewhat more important as a driver for the expansion, which also is visible if you look at how um, the increase in livestock production goes very much in parallel with the increase in soy production in the last decades. Okay, great. Uh, next question is uh, discussing a bit more about the 2019 market dynamics. Are there any, have there been any, um, any finding that show a casual re relation between the forest fires in the region and soy ex and increase in soy exports. Tim, are you? Um, I, th I think that's a difficult question to answer. Uh, also, in terms of the the timeliness of trying to compare two different types of data sets, um, you know, we obviously have seen a uh, you know an, an alarming forest fire season in 2019. I don't think that is directly going to reflect into uh, 2018-19 soy export figures, uh, just because of the, the time delay between fires happening, soy being produced, and then soy being exported. Um, uh, we have seen instances where fires uh, seem to have been uh, deliberately used as a method of uh, uh, expansion. Um, possibly for for um, further soy production. Um, so this this is something that might be visible in future uh, soy exports, uh, but obviously there's no guarantee that we would be able to extract that as an individual fact. We have a couple of questions about um, engagement efforts of banks. What do you... Um... What do you think about the current engagement efforts by banks, and could they could they op, could they engage differently in order to bring about um, changes in the Sahado? Well, um, interesting question. Yeah. Um, well, what what I think is still the case is that soy actually receives quite a lot less attention than other commodities and then I'm mostly speaking about palm oil. If you look at uh, policies of financial institutions but also um, overall attention to um, levels of deforestation then soy is still underrepresented so that is something that really yeah, needs to change urgently. It has started uh, to get more attention, especially last year since the forest fires in Brazil, but uh, soy as well as actually also cattle is still not as 
much of a priority as it should be in in engaging companies. It, I, I see that it is a, a complicated supply chain. There's no doubt about that. There, there are a lot of processing stages in it, but um, there are certainly yeah, large steps that can still be taken on transparency, on traceability, on, on yeah, publishing information, making a supplier list available, all these things where a lot could be gained and um, where also engagement by banks would be very important. And I have a question on the role of EU companies. What can, what can they do to ensure that deforestation isn't in their supply chains? Well, a lot is dependent on uh, the criteria that you put to your suppliers. Um, there are possibilities to source actually segregated soy that is fully traceable. That is one option because as soon as it gets uh, mixed, it's certainly getting a lot more difficult to ensure that you do not have soy from deforestation in your supply chain. Um, so that's two things that would already um, help to avoid deforestation. There's certainly in the much broader sense, um, the dependency on, uh, on uh, imported uh, proteins are, yeah, that is a, a problem. Um, as long as that is uh, the reliance on imported uh, soy that drives further production growth, it's, uh, yeah, the problem will be difficult to solve. But uh, certainly having very strict criteria on, on your sourcing of soy will be very important. And uh, that different stages of the soy supply chain that these criteria need to be fulfilled. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, another question is, can the Sahara be developed without deforestation? <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> it's a very, well, very the broad thing is, question, but yeah, it's what, yeah. Uh, but well, I think maybe an Im important point about that is that um, it's certainly also this question of uh, is you know can a country not develop? That is certainly a, a key question. But especially if you look at agricultural lands, then if you look at Brazil, there is a lot of land already developed where it. Um, would be possible to expand agricultural production and it's not necessary to actually um, deforest new areas to be able to produce. So that's a very important point to consider that there is a, I don't know, Tim may know the number of the, the estimate of how much land has already been uh, deforested in the past. Yeah, so I believe that uh, approximately 55% of the Sahado uh, has already been cleared in the past. I think that that is an, an answer to that question. There is a, a lot of land available. There's a lot of degraded land. There's a lot of cattle pasture that would also be used for other uh, crops or other purposes. And there have been studies in the past that, that very clearly show that there's quite a lot of economic potential in expansion into uh, uh, areas that do not have native vegetation cover. So I think it's, uh, uh, it's very safe to say that there are definitely uh, economic development routes that do not require further deforestation or native vegetation clear. Okay, great. A couple more questions here. One is, uh, building off of that is the Sahara Manifesto. What do, um, what are the prospects of that bringing about a zero deforestation, um, zero deforestation in the Sahara? Yeah, I think I think what, the way that we've been looking at it uh, um, is that that what it provides is a very clear market signal. So there's 140 consumer goods companies and investors who have signed a statement of support of the Sahado Manifesto and, and very clearly indicate that there's a, there's a significant segment of the market um, that is pushing for zero deforestation beyond 
uh, uh, legal stipulations. I think as a signal, it's extremely powerful. Um, the, the question obviously is what are the next steps? What are the solutions? Um, there's been a lot of talk about uh, uh, compensation mechanisms and, and providing financial incentives to farmers uh, for foregoing their, their legal right to uh, clear further land. Uh, that's that's been delayed. It's been it's been slow going, given that we are in uh, in 2020 already. Um, I think another key observation here is that, looking at Barbara's question as well, there's a number of of key actors within those supply chains that are not necessarily part of of the the movements around the Sahara Manifesto and may um, continue to operate as usual um, and 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 would be key actors to get involved more. Um, but I think there are examples also from other commodities where we do see, you know, a strong and coordinated effort from supply chains, from markets that, that can really shape sectors. And, and the palm oil industry is an example of that. Okay, great. Uh, we'll have one last question here. And if, um, if we didn't get to your questions, you can, uh, f again, feel free to get in touch with us um, after, this, uh, after this event. Um, why is there little transparency in the soy sector when it, com when it comes to publishing lists of suppliers? Um, we see companies in the palm oil sector, um, uh, for example, taking strides in this area, but not in, but not when it comes to soy. Well, I think one reason is probably that the palm oil sector has been uh, subject to quite a lot of public pressure and probably more than we have seen for the soy sector. So, um, yeah, um, I think the pressure has certainly changed a lot in the palm oil sector. So if that pressure would be increased on soy, that could also change something. Okay, great. Um, so uh, thank you to Barbara and Tim for the presentation and for the uh, Q&A. And I appreciate all, everybody tuning in today for this, for this event. Again, um, feel free to get in touch with us and also look for a recording and a copy of the presentation online in the coming days. Uh, thanks again and talk to you all soon.